I think we're just about to um, to get started, and uh, and again, uh, please don't hesitate to um, make additional trips up for uh, food and drink. As always, this is a mix of uh, one of the uh, named lectures that we take uh, great uh, pride in, and um, a chance informally to get to know um, a terrific uh, scholar and someone who's been enjoying uh, a visit to uh, Osgood, and I know many have already connected with, um, and I'll introduce uh, Christine in a moment, but just to say at the outset something about the Janae uh, Lecture Series. This was, um, this will be the first of our Janae Global Lectures for the uh, winter 2013 academic term. And the program, again, for those who um, have not been to any of the earlier ones, was established in 1989 through a very generous uh, donation uh, to honor uh, Pierre Genet, who was one of our, our foremost um, litigators and uh, legal uh, leaders uh, during his uh, long career. And he was a graduate of Osgood, former treasurer of the Law Society, uh, and again, someone who uh, really saw the law in terms that were both global and local. And so uh, it's um, entirely fitting that it's in uh, his honor that the uh, Pierre Genet Fellows Program was created. Uh, each year we have a diverse range of scholars who come for the lecture, but also uh, for a period of time to work with our graduate students, connect with scholars in their field. Uh, and again, uh, as I said, we're um, very uh, grateful to have uh, Gr Christina Rodriguez with us, but who has been with us how long now? About three weeks. Feels like uh, three <laughs> months, but it's only been three weeks, as she has been everywhere. Uh, she um, comes to us uh, from uh, Yale, where uh, she has um, uh, recently been uh, appointed from uh, a longer stint at NYU, but also uh, did her um, undergraduate and law degrees at, uh, at Yale, uh, and uh, I am told um, uh, also, and uh, this is good inspiration for the students in the room, uh, won the uh, prize for the best paper by a third year law student, uh, and her future was uh, set, <laughs> uh, having uh, been bitten by that bug. She, uh, though, has not um, remained uh, ensconced only in uh, wonderful academic settings. She also uh, has served as a Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Office of Legal Counsel in the U.S. Department of Justice, uh, and as I said, um, uh, has uh, previously um, uh, taught uh, and uh, been a part of the uh, NYU uh, Law School. Her field uh, is uh, broadly construed immigration, citizenship, what constitutes identity, and the relationship between rights-based discourses, identity-based discourses, uh, and of course, uh, there's no topic more front and center in the US and around the world, including in Canada at the moment, than sorting out uh, our immigration policy, but also situating it within uh, broader discourses and broader context. So the uh, topic um, uh, today is immigration and the civil rights agenda. Uh, this um, is uh, developed out of uh, several ongoing projects and projects to come. I'm looking forward to hearing more about it and then to moderating a brief um, discussion period afterwards. So without uh, any further preliminaries, please join me in welcoming Professor Christina Rodriguez to Osgood. Thank you. Thanks so much. Oh. Uh, this, <laughs> then you need this? Or no, I think I have amplification here. She comes so. with amplification. <laughs> so thank you to all of you for being here this afternoon. I want to thank Dean Sawson and the faculty at Osgood Hall Law School for inviting me to be part of your community this semester. I'd also like to thank the Genet family for contributing this to the intellectual life of the community. And I would also like to especially thank Jody Ann Rowe Butler, who has made it possible for me to be here and work and who has coordinated all of this. So thank you very much, Jody Ann, for all of your help um, and work. So in 2007, I was walking through the Mission District in San Francisco, which is a part of the city where there's a lot of public art. And this image by Jaime Mendoza was actually a giant mural on the side of a gallery in the Mission District. And the title and basically the 
full scope of the image is immigration the new black. And you might wonder, well, what did Mendoza mean by calling immigration the new black? The first thing that might come to mind, perhaps depending on who you are, is the fashion idiom. Gray is the new black, brown is the new black, 30 is the new 40, that sort of thing. Um, wherein black is a versatile staple of a society that complements all other elements of a system, but is then replaced by a new staple, a new standard. And gray suddenly becomes more popular than black and becomes the complement that holds the system together. So as applied to immigration, what could this possibly mean? Is the artist's meaning that immigration has become a basic staple of our society? This mural was designed in 2007, as I said, around the same time that activists were staging days without immigrants or walkouts by immigrants in workplaces around the country to attempt to demonstrate how indispensable immigrants had become to the social life of the United States in an effort to build support for immigration reform. But if immigration is the new black, what exactly is it replacing? And, and what explains that red splotch in the center of the canvas? Well, I think Jaime Mendoza did intend to evoke the fashion idiom, but I think he also had a double meaning. And the red splotch calls to mind, I don't know if you can see the red here, but this iconic image of the civil rights movement. It's a painting by Norman Rockwell called The Problem We All Live With, depicting a young schoolgirl being escorted by federal marshals to school during the civil rights era and being pelted by tomatoes by the angry crowd that was resistant to integration at the time, which required federal support, support by federal troops to make possible. And so what Mendoza may be suggesting by calling immigration the new black and clearly linking it to this iconic image of the civil rights movement is that immigration and the struggle for immigrants' rights represents a new civil rights movement. It is either the inheritor or a new instantiation of the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s, where blacks throughout the South sought inclusion and an end to the Jim Crow system of segregation. That's one potential additional interpretation to the double meaning. Now, some of you may know that one of the other elements of life in the mission is that when someone posts a mural, including on a gallery that's been formally um, commissioned, when the mural's been formally commissioned, is that members of the community participate in the mural art. And so when I arrived at the mission and saw this um, initial mural, which had a photo of it on the inside, what the outside mural actually looked like was this. The community and the mission, various graffiti artists, had painted over uh, the mural. But that was actually part of what the artist intended. And the thing that drew my attention most immediately was the substitution for the new black of the word inspires. What would the person who wrote inspires after immigration intended to have meant? One interpretation might be that he interpreted the equation of immigration with the new black as a kind of demoralizing statement, a statement that immigrants are the new bottom rung of the social ladder, that immigrants are the new marginalized outsiders of society, and so instead sought to make the, the image into one that was more affirmative in nature. Perhaps he also intended to make a simply affirmative statement in and of itself without regard to whether the original painter had intended a negative correlation between immigrants and the subordinated black figure of the civil rights movement. The other thing you might not be able to see, um, you probably can't from over there, is in the corner, there is a statement of one of the classic mottos or slogans of the Chicano power movement of the 1960s and 70s, and that's that we didn't cross the border, the border crossed us. It was a slogan meant to invoke the Mexican-American war and American imperialism, and a statement that Mexicans actually belong in the Southwest United States, that they are not interlopers, that immigrants have not crossed a border in an illegitimate way, but that in fact that was territory that was rightfully theirs. So you know, it's difficult to know exactly what the people who were painting over this intended. It's difficult to know whether Mendoza actually intended the double meaning that I've ascribed to it. But one thing that he was definitely intending to do was to inspire a community dialogue about the meaning of immigration. And all of these interpretations and any others that you might give to this sequence of events is intended in some way to link the debate over immigration reform to struggles for social justice and to the civil rights movement in particular. The iconic movement for inclusion and equality in American history. So this community dialogue is among the reasons that I began to ask the question that I want to address today. And that is, what does it mean to juxtapose the immigration debate with the civil rights movement? 
numerous scholars, Latino and other activist organizations, immigrants themselves, and even the federal government have adopted the language of the civil rights movement as part of their activism in support of immigration reform. The large-scale marches in support of immigration reform that took place in cities around the United States in 2006 and 2007 and spurred the legislative debate that went on then were widely touted as heirs to the civil rights marches of the 50s and 60s. A 2006 Pew Hispanic Center survey revealed that 63% of Latinos thought of these marches as the beginning of a new civil rights movement. In litigation and in public commentary, immigrants' rights advocates and even the Department of Justice in its briefs before the courts have characterized the state and local laws that have emerged since the 2005 period when this debate began, the majority of which seek to make life difficult for unauthorized immigrants, as modern day instantiations of Jim Crow, that system of segregation that brutally suppressed blacks in the southern United States in the late 19th to mid 20th century. But when scholars or activists or litigators invoke the civil rights movement or try to draw an analogy between state action and Jim Crow segregation in advocating for immigration reform, or when they charge that the treatment of non-citizens undermines civil rights, what is it that they mean? They might mean any number of things, and I think it's valuable to distinguish among them to try to understand this rhetorical strategy and whether or not it makes sense as a way of framing the debate. <laughs> The message could be that the continually protected civil liberties of immigrants have been violated, or that immigrants have been denied the protections of generally applicable social welfare legislation. The reference could also be to civil rights externalities generated by efforts to crack down on illegal immigrants in particular, rights violations that would fall disproportionately on US citizens and lawful immigrants who happen to be of Hispanic or Latino origin. And sometimes the appeal to civil rights might reflect a desire to tap into something grander, the historical struggle for justice and inclusion by marginalized groups embodied in the civil rights movement as social struggle, which sought for the end of the Jim Crow system of oppression. To tap into that, to build the moral case for immigration reform, and to build the moral case for the legalization of illegal immigrants. So the basic argument that I've made when considering this possible use of the civil rights paradigm, which is what I believe Jaime Mendoza intended and what the members of the community and the mission were also grappling with when they interacted with his mural, is that when assessing the rhetorical and political strategy of civil rights and its connection to the immigration debate, we ought to distinguish between two interconnected but distinct ways of understanding civil rights in the immigration context. The first formulation is universalistic in orientation, and it emphasizes the rights of all persons to basic respect for their dignity and to protection from arbitrary state action. This formulation focuses on personhood and promises immigrants the protection of generally applicable laws, as well as a limited but important set of constitutional rights. With this formulation, I have no objection, though for reasons I will explain, I think it is necessarily limited in its reach. And this concept of civil rights cannot and will not resolve the so-called immigration debate that's been percolating in the United States for at least a decade and has reached the national stage yet again and is in the form of legislation currently being considered by Congress. The second civil rights formulation regards these rights that emanate from personhood as a baseline, but ultimately seeks full membership in the people. It seeks to link the cause of immigrants' rights or the immigration debate rhetorically and conceptually to the social struggle that was the civil rights movement and to transform the immigration debate into a debate about the er eradication of inequalities and to position non-citizens, including and especially the unauthorized non-citizen, as the modern day version of the African American protagonists of the fight against Jim Crow. This is the formulation that I want to spend most of the time unpacking and challenging. Now, I do think that debates about whether to incorporate non-citizens, particularly those who fall in the category of unauthorized or illegal immigrant, can benefit on the reflection of the intersection of the similarities between the civil rights movement and the current social struggle for immigrant incorporation. And meaningful similarities definitely exist between the population we're talking about today and those who were the protagonists of the civil rights movement. There are many poor, non-white immigrants who perform essential but difficult labor, often under exploitive conditions, who are demanding recognition. Unauthorized immigration in particular exacerbates these subordinated and undemocratic social conditions. The status of illegality 
erases legal and social personality and a person's capacity to be an effective social actor or to defend his or her interests in the political process. The inequality of the unauthorized may be justified by virtue of their status, but it puts the state in a near complete absolute position over the unauthorized individual. But as real as these converg convergences might be between the nature of what it means to be an authorized immigrant in the United States today and what it meant to be part of uh, the segregated side of the Jim Crow South, I would emphasize that immigrant incorporation and the civil rights agenda implicate equities different in kind. Whereas the protagonists of the civil rights movement sought recognition of the full citizenship guaranteed to them by the 14th Amendment in their place of birth, immigrants seek entrance into a new polity that has made no pre-existing commitment to their inclusion. Immigrant incorporation must be justified on its own terms, not as a legacy of a prior social struggle. And it must be justified politically in the context of each new generation, which inevitably leaves some of the claimants outside of the circle of inclusion. So as a general matter, the people or the body politic takes shape over time through social contestation and not the operation of universalistic norms. This kind of contestation was, of course, a hallmark of the civil rights movement. But the movement's animating justification came from the same types of sources as the personhood formulation, from a moral requirement. But whereas the personhood formulation entitles non-citizens to respect for certain rights by virtue of their identity, the process of incorporation requires taking into account the prerogatives of the existing members of the body politic. And that is the crux of the immigration debate. I think that understanding precisely what is meant by equating civil rights to the immigration debate will help properly ground any critique of actions taken by the government and will help formulate realistic expectations of the legislative process and of public opinion, something that I think is often missing among those who advocate for immigration reform. Linking the immigration debate to the civil rights movement and expecting a moral victory is too easy. It skips the hard step of justification, and it ignores the interests of the existing body politic. So before proceeding any further, I want to issue a, a basic caveat. So the idea of reciprocity that I'm saying is embodied in the construction of the people and is part of the process of constructing the polity, which distinguishes it from the idea of personhood and universalistic civil rights, itself assumes a premise that's contestable. And that's that the body politic is justified in or ought to control its membership. I want to leave aside for today the question of the legitimacy of states closing their borders, a question to which political theorists have given a lot of recent attention, spurred in part by Joseph Karen's compelling indictment of the morality of borders. It's a fruitful line of inquiry, though I don't think theorists have yet come up with a convincing ideal theory of immigration restriction. My own view is that while this justification for closing borders or regulating borders is an important and fascinating inquiry, the more important question, especially for those who are interested in the operation of governmental institutions, is how a state ought to exercise closure. Because whether it's justified or not, states exist and will police entry and exit. So the question in how to define membership is a question that is at the heart of this connection drawn between the immigration debate and the civil rights movement, where those who draw the connection claim that the incorporation is an inexorable consequence of the principles of civil rights that are reflected in our major laws. But that's the principle I want to contest. Now, in order to understand uh, why it's more complicated than the easy formulations that debates like these ones depicted in the murals might suggest, it's important to understand the particular context of the debate in the United States. This debate about how to incorporate non-citizens, including irregular migrants, as they're called in Europe, is something that has universalistic appeal. But there are certain factors that give it a special edge um, in the United States. The first is that since the 1990s, the sheer numbers of immigrants who have entered the US has outpaced the flows of any other period in our history. There are approximately 40.4 million immigrants in the United States today. That's 13% of the population, which actually may seem like a small percentage to Canadians, where at least in 2002, the percentage was close to 19%, so a much higher proportion. But in the United States, the only other time in history when the proportion has been that high was at the turn of the 20th century, when we had the massive wave of Eastern European and Southern European migration. So the point is, is that the long-term implications of this immigration law are just now being worked out, or of this change in the demography. 
But crucially, and this is an element that's missing from, largely missing from the debate in Canada or Australia, it's more present in Europe, is that a substantial portion of this population is unauthorized or illegal, a factor that adds a particular edge to the debate in the United States. So according to various studies by the Pew Hispanic Center, the population has gone from 8.4 million in 2000 to a peak of 12 million in 2007 to a new equilibrium of about 11 million or so unauthorized immigrants over the last few years. And some 70% of those unauthorized immigrants come from Latin America, mostly Mexico. And the substantial remainder of those are Asian, and there's some Canadians in there too. Um, but the intersection of illegality and racial change thus adds a, a particular charge to the debate in which illegality becomes a crisis and a threat, sometimes out of proportion to the genuine challenge that it presents to institutions economically or in terms of uh, criminal justice and that sort of thing. So the second important factor to keep in mind when thinking about the way the debate is unfolding in the United States is that Latino immigrants in particular have dispersed across the country in patterns very different from the way that they have dispersed historically. So places, namely in the southeast of the United States and the Midwest, are experiencing immigration for the first time, or at least their experience with immigration is historic and it's immigration from Europe. So the migration of Latinos in particular and Mexicans in particular throughout the United States to new destinations has forced the conservative impulse to preserve and resist diversity to the fore of the debate. And many localities have chosen to act preemptively to make it difficult, if not impossible, for unauthorized immigrants to live within their jurisdiction. The Arizona law that gained notoriety around the world is the best example of this, but at least the Arizona law, one, limited itself to the police's authority to ask questions of people in public, and secondly, was substantially clipped by the Supreme Court um, in its last term. Whereas in other states, litigation continues about laws that I think ultimately are more damaging, including those laws that would deny even basic housing unless you can prove your legal status. Now, I think these communities' capacities for adaptation and adjustment over time should not be underestimated. And in many large urban areas around the country in particular, unauthorized immigrants have found shelter from federal law enforcement and access to the benefits of local citizenship. But these very divergent and emotional reactions to a new population make it difficult to reach a national consensus on what it means to constitute the people and whether we should expand the bounds of the polity. And then finally, the last factor that makes a big difference to the nature of the debate and, and makes it in some people's minds a truly existential one is that this immigration is contributing to the emergence of a majority minority society, something that I think has already happened in Toronto or maybe happening in Toronto, but it's happening across the United States. So the speculation, and this is supported by research based on census data and the current population survey, is that by 2013, the Latino electorate will double in size from what it is today and consist of nearly 25% of the entire electorate. And the population as a whole, by 2050, will be 30% of the United States. And by this same period, because of other um, ethnicities' growth in the United States, the country will become a majority and minority society. And so the question is, can we sustain the equilibrium and race relations that we've reached over the last generation with this change in our demography? And it produces anxiety not just in the so-called mainstream or white population, but among minority populations themselves. Even Hispanics are deeply ambivalent about illegal immigrants and low-wage workers in particular, and about what their presence and incorporation might mean for the status of the group as a whole within the American polity. So all of these are factors that underscore that the debate in the United States is about what America actually is, racially and culturally. And so it's not surprising that you would see activists like Jaime Mendoza and the people in the mission and scholars who are of this uh, vein calling for a link to the civil rights movement to try to reach for the best in our traditions to make sense of what is a fundamental change for some people in who our society consists of. Nor is it surprising that this interaction of racial diversity with illegality would lead others to reject altogether the very legitimacy of the claim for incorporation. And so it's in this context that we can now consider how and what it means to frame immigrants' rights in civil rights terms, and whether there's not an alternative that might actually better capture what I argue is the reciprocal dimension of incorporation into the people. 
So I want to start very briefly by talking about the first civil rights formulation I mentioned, the personhood formulation, the one that's universalistic in orientation. Scholars have written at length about this, and the parameters of this are, are not contested, though its operation and its implementation certainly is. The concept of personhood has been mobilized to challenge legal and political distinctions made between citizens and aliens. And the legal literature in particular uncovers how courts in the United States, courts in Canada, courts in Australia, courts in Europe have interpreted provisions in their various constitutions and laws that protect the rights of persons to extend those rights to non-citizens, thus recognizing that there are certain universally applicable rights to all people who fall within the jurisdiction of a given nation state. In the US, the sources of these kinds of protections are the due process clauses of the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments and the Equal Protection Clause, both of which promote a kind of rule of law agenda by restraining arbitrary straight state action. And the courts in the United States, in developing this framework, have highlighted how social policy goals that sound inequality and justice, namely avoiding creating castes and having the arbitrary exertion of state power used against uh, particular castes of individuals, can be served by even-handed treatment of non-citizens. So it's a fairly stable regime. As I said, it doesn't operate perfectly. Critics of the federal government's deportation policies would point to the government's failure to respect humanitarian concerns and due process norms in the exercise of deportation policy. Under the Obama administration, deportations have actually risen to record levels. Approximately 400,000 people per year in the last four years have been removed from the United States. And critics charge that this reflects a lack of appre appreciation for pro proportionality in law enforcement. But when fully realized in practice, when legislatures exercise restraint in their treatment of non-citizens in light of these background constitutional norms I mentioned, when the executive enforces the law in a proportional manner and takes humanitarian concerns into account when exercising discretion, and when courts act as backstops to the political actor's excesses, the personhood formulation meaningfully protects the basic rights of immigrants. But despite its relative stability in US law, it's also stable in Canadian law um, and in the Australian regime as well, the personhood formulation falls short of the incorporation that's reflected in this kind of project and the highest ambitions of the Civil Rights Project. Personhood, after all, does not entitle non-citizens to the core elements of membership, which I believe are the right to vote, um, and maybe even more importantly, the right to remain in the land that you call your home. Personhood also does not require existing members of the polity to take equal or even meaningful concern of non-citizens' political interests or of their demands on public resources and institutions. And poor, courts and political actors can justify exclusions from these things by appealing to national sovereignty and tapping into powerful socio-cultural understandings of nationhood, that a nation or a people are made up of persons tied together for historical, emotional, and practical reasons. Personhood cannot confer the socio-cultural dimension of citizenship or full membership, a good that can take time even for new members to acquire, and a form of incorporation that's outside the scope of my focus on the legal and the political. And so, though an understanding of civil rights of immigrants grounded in universal personhood is valuable, it has a very particular and limited meaning. So the second civil rights formulation, the one that's recalled in this um, reference to this um, image and in this debate occurring on the streets of San Francisco is much more demanding in nature. The question about who the people of the United States should be is a more complicated project than identifying what our universal humanity entitles us to. At the level of constitutional law, the people does have a meaning that's different from persons, and it's embodied in the Supreme Court's case law discussing the provisions of the Constitution that refer to the people. Those would be the Fourth Amendment protection against unreasonable search and seizure, and the Second Amendment protection, again, protection in favor of the right to bear arms. What's important for my purpose in these cases is that the Supreme Court has never regarded the people as coterminous with the citizenry. And it has also adopted what I would call a sociological rather than a formal conception of the people. So for example, in a famous Fourth Amendment case that addressed whether a Mexican national whose home in Mexico had been searched by FBI agents could claim that the search was unreasonable, the answer was no. He was a Mexican national in Mexico with no ties to the US. The court nonetheless referred to the people as a class of 
persons who are part of a national community or who have otherwise developed sufficient connection with this country to be considered along a trajectory defined by degree of connection. So it's membership as affiliation. In other instances, the court has talked about the people as entailing earned membership in a similar fashion that doesn't necessarily map onto formal legal status. Now, the court never defines these things with any specificity, and so these sources are of limited use in understanding what the people might mean. But at least as a matter of basic constitutional law, the concept of the people is much more fluid than a formal legal regime would suggest. And yet the formal regime does matter. As I've suggested, the fullest expression of membership entails access to the status of citizenship, which, as I've noted, in the United States and Canada alike, gives rise to two unique rights or privileges, the right to vote and the right to remain, and then more ephemerally, the right to consideration of your interests in the policymaking process. So in trying to understand how this development of the people, this nation-building enterprise, as I like to call it, unfolds, it will make sense to begin with this very formal legal process that defines entry into full membership, but then even more important to appreciate the extent to which the formation of the people outpaces these formalities. So on some level, the historically grounded national myth of the United States as a land that opens its arms to immigrants to become Americans remains undisturbed. The conventional account of how the people is formed starts with lawful migration, usually for the benefit of a US citizen or a US employer. It's followed by a period of legal residency during which the non-citizen, as I've suggested, can claim most of the rights of the citizen, and then culminates in naturalization and the former aliens incorporation into the full panoply of privileges and legal rights of the citizen and full membership. Now, debates abound about whether permanent residents should be given the same rights as citizens, and the federal government importantly, remains free to discriminate against non-citizens in the distribution of benefits as a prerogative of its sovereignty. But on the surface, this formal legal narrative is stable and relatively easy as a path to political incorporation. Now, as I'm sure many of you know, historically it hasn't quite worked out that way for everybody. Uh, the parameters of this narrative have been defined by the exclusion of certain groups deemed incapable of being part of the people. The most famous example is, of course, the Chinese, who were barred altogether from entry during certain parts of the 19th century, and Asians generally, who were not deemed capable of naturalizing or becoming American and couldn't naturalize until the middle of the 20th century. Now, the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s actually contributed significantly to the perfection of this narrative by helping to remove this taint of racial discrimination from the formal incorporation trajectory. Over the course of the 20th century, lawmakers eliminated categorical racial exclusions from the law, a process that culminated in the Immigration Act of 1965, which passed in the same year that Congress enacted the Landmark Voting Rights Act, which people call the most effective civil rights law in US history. So as scholars have remarked, the temporal coincidence, as well as the discursive linkage, linkage of the immigration reform of 1965 with the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 is too obvious to be missed. By the time of the act's passage, the linkage between civil rights and the elimination of race-based quotas in the immigration law had become a familiar trope of Democratic politicians. Harry Truman repeatedly issued messages to Congress calling on them to end the race-based classifications in the 40s and 50s. President Lyndon B. Johnson in the early 60s exhorted Congress in his State of the Union address to return the United States to an immigration policy which serves the national interest and continues our traditional ideals. And Hubert Humphrey, his vice president, was even more explicit when he said, we want to bring our immigration laws into line with the spirit of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So the politics as well as the achievements of the civil rights movement thus helped make the trajectory of Im immigrant incorporation more open and stable. By clearing the path of incorporation of the taint of racial preference, the immigration reforms of 65 transformed the concept of the people of the United States into a body composed without regard to ancestry or race, and we should not diminish that achievement. But the link between the legislative achievements of the civil rights era and the use of the civil rights rhetoric in the um, immigration debate is superficial, in my view. Though Truman, JFK, and LBJ all tie the end of immigration quotas to the broader civil rights objective, they did so to promote American virtue by aligning our formal legal regime with the nation's developing self-conception as a, a, a society that did not define itself in a racially determined way. 
But these reforms were process-oriented, and they did not occasion a particularly broad or deep popular debate about how a society ought to use its power to exclude or treat non-citizens who might not fit this trajectory. There was little or no social mobilization behind the immigration reforms. They were largely the product of interest group politics, Italian and Jewish lobby groups, and the State Department that thought that the quotas were harming our foreign relations with countries in Europe and important allies in Asia. So in other words, this link between the civil rights movement and a more inclusive immigration code doesn't support drawing a line from the protagonists of the civil rights movement to immigrants seeking entry today. It doesn't give us much of a resource to make the claim that we need to make. And importantly, these supposed great civil rights achievements actually sit alongside a much more discordant picture. Embedded in the regime created by the 1965 Act was a legal scheme that actually helped to give rise to the problem that most challenges the concept of incorporation today, and that is the problem of illegal immigration. The major innovation of the 1965 Act was to eliminate the country-based quotas and to apply the same numerical limit to all countries around the world, initially to the Eastern Hemisphere, which included Europe, and then eventually to the Americas. But the trick was is that the Americas had never before been subject to numerical quotas. And so between 1968 and 1980, the number of visas available to Mexicans dropped from a virtually unlimited supply to 20,000 per year in the name of formal <laughs> equality. But as Doug Massey, a sociologist of immigration, particularly Mexican immigration, has explained, when you couple that with the demographic and economic factors at work in our hemisphere, these changes in the law meant that only one outcome was possible, and that's an explosion of illegal immigration. So in achieving formal equality, these 1965 reforms actually had a disparate impact on those countries that today are the primary contributors to our illegal population. And because these ostensibly equality-enhancing numerical limits imposed that cost, the migration that had occurred freely and without restriction, even though Mexicans could, in fact, be deported, has become illegal immigration. And it's the unauthorized immigrant that complicates our story of inc incorporation. And it's to that that I want to turn and with that to conclude. The unauthorized immigrant stands as a rebuke to this conventional narrative that I've laid out about how we shape ourselves as a body politic. And so the central incorporation question today that we must confront is how to characterize their claims to membership, how to characterize the sort of social agitation that's occurring in this kind of activity. To put the question bluntly, does today's population of unauthorized immigrants have a claim to social and political incorporation on the order of the claims made by the civil rights era protagonists of blacks and Latinos in the Northeast and the Southwest? In some societies around the world, this question has, in a sense, been resolved. In places like France and Italy, the law provides for periodic legalizations, <coughs> arguably reflecting a consensus that the best way to deal with the emergence of an irregular migrant population is to recognize their existence and transform them into above-board members of society. But in the US, no such consensus has been reached. The last major legalization effort in 1986 reflected a consensus of the time, but it was tied to a particular set of legislative trade-offs made 30 years ago, or almost 30 years ago. So the difficulty today of locating the politics of legalization within a civil rights framework stems from the fact that unauthorized immigrants have broken the law. It would be disingenuous, I think, to point to the agency that they have displayed, the kind of agency that's arguably reflected here in organizing and in transforming themselves through their work into de facto members of society, but to deny at least the adult immigrant's complicity in his or her own status. Legal status is not irrelevant in the same way that race or gender or other characteristics that have been the basis of successful civil rights claims are thought to be, either morally or as a matter of constitutional law. Indeed, the formal conventional narrative casts a long shadow over this debate because it suggests that a fair, open, and easy path to inclusion exists, rendering those who don't follow it outlaws. What is more, the claim for immigrant incorporation cannot be justified along the same lines as the civil rights claims of blacks and Latinos because that, as I've said, was a demand for recognition of the promise of equal citizenship that was actually already enshrined in the Constitution. At the core of the civil rights movement was the demand for a realization of the commitment to equal citizenship, regardless of race, that had been forged through civil war and reconstruction in the 19th century. Even the Supreme Court's jurisprudence that extends some of these rights to non-citizens reflects a lingering uncertainty about the propriety of extending the protections all the way. 
the fact of citizenship as a basis for discrimination inheres in the existence of the nation state. And it's all the more glaring when we're dealing with an unauthorized population. Now, none of this is to say that unauthorized immigrants have no claim to membership. They very clearly do, just that their claim to membership is different in kind from the claims at the heart of the civil rights movement. As Linda Bosniak has explained, the unauthorized immigrant has a long dual identity in American consciousness as both an outsider to and a member of the national community. And this very instability has produced a doctrinal muddle. So the best example of this is the efforts by the courts of appeals in the last few years to come to terms whether, with whether it's unconstitutional to deny illegal immigrants access to firearms. Now, unless you're American, you might not understand the importance or intensity of this kind of debate. But the fact that conservative courts of appeals would even entertain this both demonstrates the importance of the right to bear arms as a fundamental right, but also the complexity of defining who the people might be. So none, none of the courts have had trouble ultimately affirming the government's right to restrict this population's access to firearms. But they do so in a way that reasons that unauthorized immigrants might in fact be part of the people. It's just that the government is justified in denying some of their rights because they're a shifty part of the people who can't be trusted. Um, but the way they define the population as part of the people is to point to the contributions they have made to the society around them, to the sociological form of membership that the Supreme Court also has reflected in some of its decisions decisions. And so the unauthorized immigrant becomes a potential subject of the Constitution by virtue of, to quote the Tenth Circuit, having been here for decades and nowhere else. Or, to quote the Fifth Circuit, by virtue of living in a country for 18 months, paying rent, supporting a family, accepting social obligations to employers, landlords, and family. On the basis of these contributions, they can claim membership as part of the people, though they can still be denied one of the fundamental rights because of their inherent untrustworthiness. These Second Amendment cases ultimately suggest that defining the people is actually something of a competitive dynamic that demands consideration not just of legal status, but also the contributions people have made and the risks that they pose to society. This ambivalence about the status of the unauthorized immigrant is also present in Supreme Court cases that are regarded as victories for immigrants' rights. In Plyler versus Doe, for example, in case in which the Supreme Court struck down a Texas law that would have denied students, undocumented immigrant kids, access to the public schools, Justice Brennan reflects a similar kind of ambivalence. He doesn't directly address the claim to membership of unauthorized immigrants generally. Instead, he emphasizes the child's lack of blame and the social policy implications of unequal treatment. He says denial of education to some isolated group of children poses an affront to one of the goals of the Equal Protection Clause, the abolition of government barriers, presenting unreasonable obstacles on the basis of individual merit. But the inestimable, to inestimable toll of that deprivation on the social, economic, intellectual, and psychological well-being of the individual makes it most difficult to recon reconcile the cost or the principle of status-based denial of equal education with the framework embodied in the Constitution. We cannot ignore the significant social costs borne by our nation when select groups are denied the means to absorb the values and skills upon which our social order rests. So in both Supreme Court cases addressing legal protections owed unauthorized immigrants and this public debate that surrounds the matter, we see an emerging alternative framework, and that's the framework with which I would like to conclude. It's a concept of mutual benefit predicated on a cost-benefit analysis of incorporation that takes into account both the citizens and the polity's interests and reframes the former as advantageous to the latter. Making the case for immigrant incorporation using a mutual benefit paradigm of this kind might begin from the premise that it would be impossible to deport these 11 million people, but that the negative externalities produced by having that population remain illegal demands a legalization regime. It demands incorporation and an expansion of the people. The case could cite the corrosive effects on the labor laws imposed by the existence of an illegal population that's vulnerable to exploitation. The threat of enforcement to families of mixed status that puts them under great economic stress and strains public institutions might also be part of this case. Related to the concept of mutual benefit will also be whether, as the Supreme Court and Court of Appeals cases suggest, the non-citizen has contributed anything of value or earned his citizenship. This is the rhetoric that President Obama is, in fact, using right now to describe the justification for, illegal, uh, for legalizing the illegal population. 
And in its recent decision striking down most of the Arizona law, the Supreme Court even entertained some of these positive equities. Whether the children, children were born in the United States, whether there are long ties to the community, or whether someone has a record of distinguished military service made a contribution. So taking this more naked balancing of interest approach to defining who ought to be considered part of the body politic need not mean that the civil rights framework has no role to play in constructing an argument for membership. Indeed, in identifying the ways in which unauthorized immigrants have earned membership in a sociological sense reflects justice-based considerations because it acknowledges entitlement to status based on past behavior. In addition, equality concerns or the desire to eliminate castes from our social order, a harm to which Justice Brennan alluded in Plyler, can play a crucial role in the social policy argument for legalization. Both of these concerns for justice and equality are actually behind the most recent initiative to try to do something about the unauthorized population, and that's the president's decision this summer to defer the deportation of people who are brought here as children, even though their status is unlawful. The decision to defer the deportation of millions of the unauthorized on a case-by-case -case basis reflects a realization, as Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security Napolitano noted, that our nation's immigration laws must be enforced in a firm and sensible manner, but they are not designed to be blindly enforced without consideration given to individual circumstances, nor are they designed to remove productive young people who know no other country but the United States. This willingness to treat unauthorized immigrants who arrived as children in this way reflects a deep-seated equality norm in American legal culture, an anti-inheritance principle according to which the sins of the parents should not be visited on our children. But it's mixed in with social policy concerns about the danger of having unequal castes within our society. This idea of preventing the rise of unequal castes in order to avoid negative social externalities can also inform various other parts of the debate, such as whether in a legalization program unauthorized immigrants ought to be given access to full citizenship or whether they should be kept in a legal but not full membership sort of capacity. Equality can be used to mobilize people on one side of that debate. It might also be important in being skeptical of other measures designed to prevent illegal immigration from arising, such as the creation of, of temporary worker programs. Canada is currently in vogue in a number of policy circles in the United States because ha it has a successful temporary worker regime, or so people say. But there are concerns about importing workers temporarily without giving them ultimate access to full membership in the body politic, if that's what they so desire. And that notion of equality that comes from the anti-caste norm that we inherit from the civil rights movement is an important norm to bring into the debate about how to address the contraction or expansion of the people and the people who are on its periphery. So in the end, though I think the, the connection that's drawn between the civil rights movement and the immigration debate resonates both because its universalistic formulation has a clear valence in the immigration debate and because the struggles are somewhat similar in nature. With respect to the debate that's happening in Washington right now, these questions about whether the unauthorized should be part of the polity demand something that's less simplistic than the way it's been formulated in the current debate. It appears that a once-in-a-generation piece of legislation expanding the scope of the people in the United States could make its way through Congress this spring. And as was the case last time legalization became a perennial of the immigration debate in the late 70s and early 80s, a legalization program will be the product of intense political contestation, the kind of thing that's going on on one side in this dialogue in the Mission District. And in this process, the historically drawn connection between the immigrant sinking incorporation and the protagonist of the civil rights movement can do important work. As Peter Schuck explains, when accounting for how it was that Congress in 1986 with a Republican president passed a major legalization bill, he says that the power of ideas and values preceded the interests and advanced the interests at the same time. The popular assumptions about the benefits of ethnic diversity and family unification and belief in human rights and civil liberties and due process helped to galvanize a consensus around the expansion of the immigration policy. So rhetorically linking immigrant incorporation to this paradigmatic struggle for inclusion could thus provide the historical and emotional resources necessary to break through the public ambivalence that hangs over the discussion. 
But that connection cannot be treated as self-evident or seamless. And perhaps the best way to make the analogy a persuasive one will be to argue that bringing the formal legal regime into line with the complex social struggles that define membership as a sociological matter is a matter of fairness and justice whose costs that are real can be absorbed. And such alignment will bring us ever closer to the fair society that the civil rights movement identified as worthy of perpetual pursuit, but it will be because it's to our benefit, the consider consideration of which would make all of us better participants and better members in the body known as the people. So with that, I'll take your question. Thank you. Uh so much for that. We're going to open up uh, questions in a moment. I should add that the uh, those of you who do want to explore more of the ideas, the there is a book, uh, Immigration, uh, Civil Rights, and the Formation of the People, which um, was one you uh, uh, was it co-authored um, with Adam. The one I'm thinking of. There's a, that's an article. It doesn't deal with the direct issues, but there are a couple of essays. Yeah. So I just that, wanted to make yeah. sure that this uh, for those who do want to read more, you know where to find it. Please grab a cup of coffee. Um, as we move uh, to questions. And uh, I think um, uh, as people are uh, forming uh, their questions, let me uh, maybe start you off with one that um, your talk provoked um, for me. And I've been following this recent uh, legislation in the US very much through the lens of the last election and the irony of the uh, uh, legal immigration producing demographic results that in the electorate have now made the immigration reform to have a path for the unauthorized immigrants mm -hmm. inevitable as Republicans fall over each other now right. to support it. So how much, um, uh, I was trying to figure out in your talk, is a normative thrust to want to see this through the lens of civil rights and that kind of march towards uh, norms of equality versus just the political machinations of uh, winning in a flawed system, even if winning means simply getting the right to have assault rifles. So <laughs> maybe you could tackle the, your own kind of normative place and how you situate it uh, in the context of your talk. So I think that the both of the elements that you describe, the naked ideological or partisan politics and the more idealistic desire for a better union are at work and they intersect with each other. So I think the reason why Republicans even are falling all over themselves now to try to do something on immigration is because they perceive the Latino vote to be tied to achieving something on that front. And for the first time, the Latino vote seems to have made a big difference in the election. People have been talking about it since the 80s as this electoral giant, but it's, this is the first election where it actually does seem to have made, or in some estimations, made a, a demonstrable difference. Now, I think the reason why doing something on immigration matters in the naked political sense is not because that's all Latinos care about. As I suggested, they're actually quite ambivalent as a population, especially those who've been in the United States for many generations and resent the notion that they're all border crossers. Um, the reason why they care about immigration at all is because the, the attacks on Ill illegal immigrants are perceived as a distrust of Latinos more generally, because they're often framed in terms of a danger to American culture, and the idea that people from Mexico present a danger to American culture, not surprisingly, is perceived by people of Hispanic origin as being distrustful of, of their very presence. And when you see headlines, should we fear the coming Latino majority, um, that turns off Hispanics of all types. I don't know why that should be a source of fear, um, but it is to uh, a lot of Americans. And so it's for that reason, which I think draws from the notion that we, we're all equal, our culture, whatever it is, whether it's strongly tied to the country of origin or only loosely tied to the country of origin, is as valid as this white Protestant ideal that Samuel Huntington advances, which comes from the civil rights movement, is, is animating Latinos' reaction to the response to illegal immigration. And for that reason, the naked political strategy is to opt for some kind of legislation that would satisfy all sides on some, some level. So it's a mixture of those factors. And so in, in rejecting the civil rights paradigm on some level, I don't want to suggest it doesn't play a role at all, because it, it clearly does frame the way we think about these issues. It's just not an inexorable jump from the existence of the civil rights movement to today's social struggle. It requires justification on its own terms, which is what's happening, but the civil rights instincts are an important part of that justification. All right, with that, uh, we'll open it up, uh, and I'm keeping a list. I've got uh, Pear and then uh, Danny. Thank you very much. 
Here, let me um, send one mic uh, to you and I'll uh, have the other. They're both working, right? Yeah. So my, my question has to do with um, the relationship between economic citizenship and political citizenship. Mm -hmm. So if we didn't have the 11 million, and if the media couldn't exploit that fact so much, then we would probably have a better understanding of the ongoing policies to bring in highly qualified uh, people. So because Europe has been going through the same problem, you know, I would like to know a little bit more how um, do you see the long-term perspectives of bring those more in par, you know, economic citizenship and political citizenship. So but how, what the prospects are bringing more yes, highly once, skilled. Once we go away from this focus yeah. always on 11 million illegals. Yeah, so I, I think that shifting the focus from it by solving the problem is crucial to having this other debate because I think in the, the political process anytime any element of immigration reform, which is a very varied field, comes up, this particular problem about what are we doing to ourselves as a country um, comes up and at the root of that very question is the existence of the population. So I think um, that's why a lot of business people support a general legalization program. The Chamber of Commerce, which is a sort of right-leaning organization of business owners, very powerful in the U.S., and the AFL-CIO, which is the largest I think the largest labor union, recently just issued a joint statement. They're not normally allies calling for legalization. And among the reasons um, from the Chamber of Commerce point of view is not just so that their employers can have low-wage workers, but so that they can bring in uh, or reform the system of bringing high-skilled immigrants in. Now, I think that that actually presents its own set of questions, um, moral questions, and uh, that have to be dealt with separately. So um, from the point of view of the United States, I think the same kinds of questions about are you displacing U.S. workers um, arise. And there are actually um, critiques of the call for high-skilled immigration. And again, this is another area where people tout Canada and its emphasis on high-skilled immigration is the model we should be following. But a critique that suggests that, that that's actually all manufactured by technology companies in particular that also want workers who they can exploit. They're not making minimum wage, but they're wa making less than someone who's educated in the United States might make. So that may be cynical, also partially probably true, but there's also the the uh, element of the debate, and this takes us in a more kind of global justice sort of direction that's not really the focus of what I was discussing, but there's an important part of my work and, and the, the immigration debate more generally, and that's why should the United States be siphoning off uh, these workers from other parts of the world where they could actually be contributing in a more significant way to development in those parts of the world. And then there are the debates about whether, in fact, by coming to a country like the United States or Canada, you are promoting development. And they're empirically complicated and normatively complicated. But those are debates we are not currently having because of the need to address this core problem. But I think the reason this, this problem takes up all of the space is because it's very central to who we think we are as, as a country and who we're becoming, whether you think we should be a racially diverse, equal society, or we should be a society that maintains its Anglo-Protestant heritage in, by limiting immigration. Either way, this is where the, the crux of the debate rests. Um, yeah, you know, you're reminding me why I've stayed away from teaching and writing on immigration. It's just very hard, and there are lots <laughs> of other fields that are less hard, but um, someone who doesn't shy away from hard issues uh, is our own uh, Danny, Danny. Priel. So, <laughs> can you uh, pass uh, her the mic? And I've got a couple of others on the uh, list as Thanks. well afterwards. You realize that you set up a pedestal that I will never be able to. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you very much. So, I have, I have a, uh, so, so I, I, I see very much the way that you're saying that that uh, you know we can draw on the on the on the experience of, of the 1960s rights movement, but there's some uh, difficulties, and, and some of what you said kind of fit, I think, what what sort of I see as as being uh, put into categories that fit into the 1960s. So so even the mural, that the addition to the mural, I thought that's 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 like black people saying, look, it's your my state of the way I, I am or, or the way my life is right now is because of you. So, so when they say, well, you move the, the border, you kind of shift the blame to, to them. So, so that's a, that, that, that fits. But, but then you say, well, things have changed, and, and so the, the civil rights story is not enough. So, but I want to complicate in two ways. One is um, the distributive aspect that you touched a little bit on in your answer to Pierre Nows, but, but perhaps you could say a little bit more. So um, 
I suspect that lots of people who are opposed to immigration, so yes, there's probably some racism there as well, but, but many of them fear it because they feel, and perhaps rightly so, I don't know, uh, that it will disproportionately affect them. So they will say, oh, it's very nice for the, you know, the elites living in New York to want more immigration. That doesn't affect them, but I'm the one who's going, who may lose my job. So, so there is, there is, and if, I mean, th that, if true, is perhaps a legitimate concern. So, so they may say, you know, cost-benefit analysis may suggest that for the nation, for the U.S. in total, uh, it will bring net benefit. But I, I care a little about this if I lose my job. So, so that, and, and that's, I think, a, if true, is a legitimate concern. And the second thing is more about the change in the conception of rights since the 1960s. Um, so one of the things that were considered kind of a, a great innovation was the development of, of politics of identity and, and, and group rights. And I, I think that was considered a, a strong tool for, for, for kind of uh, uh, minority groups. But now in some respect, it, it may come back to haunt those who, who favor this. So, so now people start saying, well, if group rights are something so significant, then we Americans who speak English start fearing those who don't speak English, right? They say, why should I press to, uh, one if, when I have this automated message if uh, English is, the, is, is our language in the US? So, so this change in conception of rights here uh, is, is another change from the 60s to today, and that may have been also part of the problem. Yeah, so those are both great questions. And on the first question, I think there, there are two ways to uh, approach it. One, I think, is the, the cop-out way, but it may be the correct way, and that is to talk about the empirics of the situation. Economists haven't resolved this, um, but I think the, the stronger evidence is in favor of the, the impact of low-wage immigration being primarily on those without high school educations, but it being quite limited in impact on their wages. Um, and that the act of legalization would actually reduce that impact somewhat by making the population not as exploitable. Uh, so the question is, should we be removing them or incorporating them? And so if you take a real politic view of it, you, you can't actually remove them. No, no one's truly in favor of that. So the, the rational response would be to legalize them and make the discrepancies a little bit um, less significant than they are. Um, and take advantage of the fact that it's a net benefit. It's not a great net benefit. People who claim that it is, I think, are over-claiming. But um, it's, it's almost completely a wash on, on the economic side. Um, another way of thinking about that, too, might be that, well, let's assume that there is a cost, a distributional effect. But let's find other ways of redistributing that effect through income payments or tax incentives or other things that could help the low-wage the low wage worker. Um, the second way to respond to that question is by saying, well, what exactly is your frame of reference? Are we talking about from the position of the nation state having the debate about how to constitute the, the polity itself, which is the position I'm taking, and say what's be the best for our society? And if it turns out that incorporating a bunch of low wage workers is bad for the people who are at the bottom end of our social ladder, then maybe as a democratic society we ought not to do that and find ways to address the problem differently. But then if you expand your frame of reference to think globally, and here I'm thinking of the work of Ayala Shahar and other people who've written in this vein, and you think about how there are incredible inequalities, globally speaking, that birth in the United States gives you an endowment that birth in a country um, in East Africa doesn't, for example, that that's the inequality that we should be addressing. And now her solution is not immigration to the higher wage or higher benefit countries. It's trying to come up with a redistributionist scheme across borders, and, and maybe that's the answer. But if, if you care about global justice and you're working on immigration policy, uh, you might think, well, why is it that we're giving primacy to the interests of the United States when what we're talking about is a significant differential across borders that's, that's arbitrary, and we should be playing our role globally and trying to equalize that. Um, so a lot of it, how you answer that question depends on your frame of, of reference. I've, I've taken the kind of US frame of reference, but I actually, as a general matter, are more partial to thinking of it globally and not, not being as worried about the impact on low-wage American workers when what's at stake is people who are far worse off and thinking about how to address the costs in a way that doesn't sacrifice the people who are far worse off. Ken kind of saying, 
whole rhetoric of it actually, it actually benefits the U.S. goes against it because if it goes, if it benefits the U.S., then presumably it, it harms Mexico. So, well, it's not, but it can be a win-win situation if it's in Mexico's interest also to export some of its people. That's increasingly less true, but it certainly has been true throughout the '90s and 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 the aughts. That's definitely been to their advantage. So sometimes we're in a kind of win-win situation. Sometimes we're not, and it depends on um, the empirics of the situation. Um, so I think your second question is a really interesting one about how um, the politics of identity, identity might actually be informing the reaction to immigration and the desire to preserve something about um, American identity that's being lost, potentially. Um, one response to that is to say, and I think this is probably this would probably be a good Canadian response as well, is that our core identity is a civic one, not an ethnic one, and the people who are seeking incorporation are not seeking to change the fundamental civic consensus about which rights are important, why political participation is important, that there should be people who contribute as social actors um, at the local level and take seriously their responsibilities as citizens, but that, that it, you might be changing the veneer of, of those institutions. How those institutions communicate. Um, that's one potential answer. Um, another potential answer is that, and this is something I didn't really touch on, is that, and I don't know that it would be persuasive to the kinds of people who are making the claims about Anglo Protestant identity today, is that this is all going to wash itself out over the course of a generation. Um, I've done a lot of work on language rights and language politics as well, and at least in countries like the United States and for non-French uh, non and English speakers in, in Canada, the connection to the heritage language dies after the second generation, if it even survives into the second generation. Maybe more true in the US than, than um, in, in Canada. And people consider themselves to be American first and foremost. And not from their countries of origin by the time you get to the second generation, and, and certainly by the third. The thing that makes it slightly different in the US and complicated in, in the US, and maybe this is also true, but it's because of the size of the particular ethnic group that I'm thinking about, is that the, the assimilation for a lot of immigrants in the United States is not to this general white mainstream. It's to a racialized minority group. And you actually see more negative outcomes among second generation individuals than you do among first generation immigrants precisely be well not precisely because but potentially because uh, the assimilation is occurring into a, a particular racial group that exists in the United States that is itself disadvantaged and so that's kind of a counter to the idea that it's all going to work itself out um, and then there was a, the third way of responding to your question um, and that's I think to say that we should embrace this notion of an Anglo-Protestant heritage. A lot of our legal culture comes from that heritage. It reminds me of the way that, that Joseph Weiler says that Europe should embrace its Christian identity um, when thinking about itself as a political entity. And, but there's nothing mutually exclusive between doing that and acknowledging or accepting diversity and tolerating diversity and having policies on the ground that actually enhance freedom of association and the kinds of autonomy or liberal values that might be a part of that Anglo heritage. Um, and th I think that's especially possible given the dominance of English and the fact that people will assimilate into the speaking of that, that language. Um, but I, but I, I think that um, it remains to be seen whether that actually is possible. So America today looks very different than it did in 1900. And it has a lot to do with the influx of Eastern European and Southern immigrants. It'll probably look very different in 100 years than it did in, in 2000. But I just don't know what, what that, what's that, that's going to look like. But I think the key thing is, is that I th we think of America absent the immigration of this decade as a strong America is true to its, its values. Um, even though people in 1900 would have said, if you let all these people in, that's not going to continue to be true. And I think, I would hope that we would think the same thing in 100 years as the process of assimilation works itself out. Um, and the, the last thing I'll say is that unlike a lot of people who, who write in the immigration field in the US, I'm somewhat sympathetic to that concern about preserving an identity that is considered the dominant majoritarian identity, but that has a content that makes a difference and matters in, in American culture. But what it means to be sympathetic, I think, is the, is the question. It can also be that inclusivity itself is the civic norm right. that you're aspiring to. But it, the moral ambiguity is what I'm always struck by, that if you look at it from the perspective of what right does anyone have to say no to an immigrant, it's, let's say, I'm a decision maker, so I've got to say that the very basis on which my grandparents and great-grandparents came uh, is 
now illegitimate. They could never have gotten in this country or the United States. It's not built by skilled immigrants, it's built by people who come with nothing. Uh, and so the moral legitimacy either of saying, they came with nothing but you need to have four degrees, or they got in but they got in through a racist exclusive immigration system that now I'm somehow the product of and need to continue, neither of those is a really morally comfortable place right. to be. So finding a morally comfortable place to be in a progressive immigration system is again reason number 37 why I'm not in her field. Because, uh, <laughs> like, I, I, don't, I don't know how you do it. I've got a couple of students and then uh, some more faculty. Yes. Can you try to jump in? Uh, sure, if you can. Uh, I'm fine not to be <laughs> Thanks so much, Christina. So uh, you reject the applicability of the civil rights paradigm primarily because of the supposed choice to enter illegally that mm -hmm. these individuals have made. But wouldn't the critique from the left in the United States be to push very strongly on this notion of a supposed choice? First of all, by looking at um, the tacit programs of that programs of tacit consent that attracted immigration from um, Central and Southern America um, to the United States over the years, as you as you alluded to, the Mexican American War and the history, the, the legacy of that history. Um, so those sort of tacit consent programs on the one hand, and then secondly, I wouldn't necessarily make this argument, but many leftists would argue that the economic coercion involved in uh, the choice to enter the United States on an illegal basis would render this formal distinction um, inapplicable. Uh, so how would you respond to that? Yeah, so I think what I would do is not say that um, choice is a false way of characterizing it, but instead bring in the notion of complicity, that the United States is actually complicit right. in what has happened in an extremely profound way. And so that offsets the illegality, not the illegality itself, but perhaps the negative connotations you would attach or the uh, responsibility you would attach to the illegality. And so rather than say it's not a matter of, of agency, um, we're all part of the economic system that we're embedded in. And so in some sense, none of us have choices about um, what we actually do. But, it, but instead of taking that agency away completely from people who cross the borders to say, it's actually they're making rational, justified decisions in the context of the socioeconomic order that we're all a part of from Canada down to um, Guatemala or however far down you want to um, describe it. And so I think that that, um, even though I didn't mention it, is something that would be relevant in this kind of cost-benefit approach that I would take. It, it's, it's not strictly an interest in the sense that it, it is about um, accountability on the side of the, the polity that's making the judgments. But the, the difficulty of making that kind of an argument in the debate when people are talking about what we should do about people who are here unlawfully is that the choice is not, the complicity is not the product of the choice of any particular individual. It's part of a system. And so it's really, really hard. And, and theorists who try to work on this question have a really hard time identifying, well, where is the complicity actually coming from? I mean, some of it is arguably from enforcement decisions that get made decision not to police the border as strictly as it could be policed, but who makes that decision? It's made on a case-by-case, -case, daily basis. Um, it comes in part from the economic expectations of consumers, but um, how do you assign responsibility to consumers in that sense? So we're just participating in, in the market and um, jump at lower prices, but aren't actually responsible for the moves that enable those prices to become uh, lower. So the, the difficulty of assigning where that complicity comes from is what makes it hard to use as an argument in the debate. Um, and I just resist the idea of taking the concept of agency or choice from the intending immigrant because it's immobilized in so many other settings to their ad advantage. But I, I think the point is a, is a really valid one that makes the, the political debate about it just that much more complicated. So I think what we'll do is let's take um, a few uh, questions that I've seen uh, around at once. And if you don't mind uh, nope. jotting a note, or down, a note or two down, that way we can uh, make sure to get as many voices in. Um, so I'm curious about your use of the word immigration. And, and I just kind of want to complicate it a little bit. Um, you know, because they're like, you know, immigration is, is such a, like, it can be so, you know, 
can be disaggregated, you know, refugees, uh, economic migrants, uh, illegal migrants or undocumented migrants, uh, guest workers, so many different uh, legal bases, normative bases that come with each, each of those strands of immigration. And I, I guess my question, just in the, in the context of your argument, would be, um, do, do different types of immigrants have a, a differential, uh, differential claim to the tropes and the schemas uh, and the anical, analytical resources of uh, the civil rights movement? All right, we'll hold that uh, thought. Um, that's uh, in your question, and I think, uh, Wow, because that used like four words I didn't even know. <laughs> All right, we'll go to Hutch and then uh, Ben uh, will squeeze yours in and, and then we'll have some informal back and forth after the formal end, but let's uh, hear from Hutch. Thanks. Uh it was very provocative. One thing it provokes in me is, I'm not clear here about the, the level of analysis. So it seems to me the unit of your critical analysis is the immigrants, layered over, of course, primarily by race. But this is a difficult concept to think about, particularly in terms of the United States, if one takes a longer historical look, because it's an immigrant society. And so it seems to me you could say, well, we're all immigrants, so what is, what is special about this particular discussion? And it seems to me that flips it around a little by saying, isn't a main unit of analysis here still that of race rather than immigration? And so one way to put this would be to say, if you, you could change the um, let wording upon this um, mural, which would say black, the new immigrant. So in a sense, if you want to understand this, it's not through immigration in a society which more than most, certainly Europe, is an immigrant society, but it's just a particular way of thinking about race again. And we use immigration as the shorthand or immigrant for just another form of uh, racism. Um, Christina, thank you so much for that. And just one quick point, which is I wondered when you first drew the link between the poster and the um, or the mural, civil rights movement. I uh, I heard a reading that that wasn't developed, and maybe it's too idiosyncratic, which was an invocation of the notion that civil rights um, legal advocacy uh, would similarly be ineffective uh, from the courts as it was with. Uh, black population and that there's a kind of similar sense that social change would be most most necessary. It's an indictment of a civil rights uh, litigation kind of stance. But the, the real question was, um, I just wondered uh, how specifically American this story is in, in any shape or whether or not um, it's sort of syntax is American, but it's sort of the, the basic understanding is really about a kind of um, uh, instability of constitutional theory that remains based on a constituent power, constituted authority kind of framework. That it's expressed in a certain syntax in the US, but that it's happening in the EU and it's happening around the world, um, kind of destabilizing conventional modes of how power and authority in constitutional frames is actually even constituted. Um, not at all to say that the American story isn't important. I think it's crucial. It's neat seeing the U.S. kind of come to terms with actually being in the Americas, you know, in this kind of <laughs> form. Uh, but I just wondered if, if, if the story is about constitutional theory in some mm -hmm. way or about Americans. So um, all great questions. Let's see if we can do each of them justice in a few minutes. So as to, to your question, I think the answer is definitely yes. Um, and you raise, I think, the paradigm case of the immigrant who um, political theorists, legal regimes, human rights advocates have all coalesced around and agreeing represents the person entitled to some form of incorporation, and that's the refugee. I, I think the, the one area where everyone who debates the legitimacy of exclusion of borders recognizes there's some obligation on the part of the state is to the person who can't be protected by his or her state of origin. And there are obviously a lot of devils in the details about those regimes of protection, but the basic idea that we all owe to people who can't be protected in their countries of origin some form of refuge um, 
permeates from the highest levels of theory down to the basic legal regimes that exist. And, and I think that that's, a, that's justified by a different form of justification than what I'm talking about, which is it comes from the universalistic principle that all people are entitled to respect for their dignity. And for some people, that means incorporation into a nation state that's not their own because they can't find that where, where they come from. But this debate that, that I'm highlighting and that um, occurs periodically in um, not just the US and other, other parts of, of the world is more difficult um, because there isn't that kind of consensus about whether that person is entitled to a better life if they can, in fact, have the protections of their basic human dignitarian interests in their societies of, of origin. I think the, that debate also breaks down by distinctions among different types of immigrants. And those distinctions are at the heart of a lot of immigration policy debates. Is someone who's coming to join their family different than someone who's coming to contribute economically? What about the person who doesn't have a pre-existing tie to the United States or to, to Canada and can't find a way in? Why isn't that person entitled to the same kind of protection? They would be regarded as different because there's not someone already on the inside who has an interest in their, their entry. Um, but yes, I do think that each of those cases is a different case of, of some sort. Um, so to the question about the unit of analysis, I think that's a hard one that I'm going to have to, to think some more about. Uh, my first instinct is to say that, no, they are, in fact, different. Because even though there's the, the overlay of race in the immigration debate, I don't think you can escape it. And that's what this, um, these images are all about. Um, it's still, if you abstract it from the details, a question about how someone who's from the outside gets an entitlement to come into the inside. And maybe you can't, div and so the unit of the immigrant is that person, the person to whom the polity has not made a commitment. What is the basis for his claim to incorporation? And what would justify the polity in excluding him, or what would require the polity in bringing him in? And that is the unit of the immigrant. Um, but I think if you put it into the particulars of the debate of any country's history, particularly the history of the United States, the debate that we're having now in, on some level is about race. It's kind of what I was saying in response to Danny's last question, that um, it is about, it's an identitarian debate where the central question is our racial slash cultural future. And in that sense, the unit of analysis would be race and all this other stuff. It's just a form of excuse um, to try to exclude um, or to try to preserve something that there's no legitimacy in, in preserving. Um, but at least at the level of, of theory, I want to maintain that the unit of analysis is, in fact, this thing called the immigrant, the alien, the person um, who challenges a democratic state in a different way than an existing member who is a, a member of a racial minority. Those debates are, are different ones. Um, and that kind of leads to the answer that I would give to you, um, at least initially. And that's that I do think. Um, if what you mean by instability in constitutional theory, it's the inability of constitutional theory to grapple with how people from the outside are, are brought in. Yes, I think that's what is at the heart of, of this debate. It's also maybe it's about the instability of international law and the system of, of nation states. Um, and constitutional theory and political theory don't have good answers to these questions. And people in political theory are trying to come up with them, but they're resisted strongly by people who, by theorists of democracy in particular, which is so tied to the notion of the, of the nation state. And constitutions obviously are very tied to the, the notions of the, the nation state. Um, I think that. It, the degree to which the constitutional regime is capable of absorbing these questions will differ depending on the society that you're talking about. And I actually think the United States and maybe Canada are much better positioned and less unstable, so to speak, than other parts of the world, Europe, um, where they, I don't think they have even constitutional resources to deal with these kinds of, of questions to the same degree. Um, but. The, I think the question that you're posing is the one that I've avoided um, <laughs> in, in my work um, and have consumed other people trying to answer this question, and that is, how do you reconcile the existence of a constitutional democracy with the power to exclude? And there's just, there aren't resources in, in constitutional law to answer that, that question. Um, the, in US constitutional theory, the resources that answered are very kind of sledgehammer type answers based on fundamental principles of sovereignty that you retreat to and are kind of conversation stoppers. Um, but it's a, it's a conversation worth continuing.
No, no, Christine, I think um, not only uh, will the conversation continue, but I think it's particularly important to have it here, both at a law school that just crossed the threshold of a third of our JD class having been born in another country for the first time in the history of the school, and in a city that just crossed the threshold of 50% of all the residents having been born in another place. So I think if there's an experiment in which Canada can legitimately put itself out there as the vanguard of the camp of let's see what happens uh, when you cross these tipping <laughs> points, uh, this is the moment when it's happening and I can't think of a better place to have the conversation and we're incredibly grateful uh, that uh, you're here to lead it and thank you for that talk and discussion and join us for Victor Tadros at the next Janae lecture uh, coming up later in March. But uh, that was wonderful. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thanks very much to all of you.